Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the Texas USA 2013 series. The topic is Basic Principles of Progression. Presented by Jesus on the 9th of November 2013. This is session one, part two. So I'd like to ask about, um, so feeling the truth around the abuse. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've felt a lot of my emotions, unless you want to tell me differently. <laughs> but um, yeah, a I lot of times, so. I, a lot of times I do feel like I can't feel anything. So I'm wondering, is that my resistance to feeling, or is there spirit influence, like attachments that don't want me to feel? Well, there are, but, you know, you have resistance to feeling. The reality is that every person on earth who's been abused, who doesn't want to feel about the abuse, attracts a whole group of people of the same gender, generally, from the spirit world, who have also been abused, who think the best course of action is to not feel about it. All right? And that's a normal attraction. Of course, that's going to be attraction. But it all begins with the fact that the person on earth doesn't want to feel about it. And if you go numb, you don't want to feel. Uh, that's reality. If you're numb, you don't want to feel. So be honest about it. I don't want to feel the truth. I don't want to feel it. Be honest about how, you know, and one feeling you will have is how angry you are that you have to feel it. That, that'll be one feeling that you eventually go through about how angry you feel that somebody did something to you that now you have to feel about. The majority of people who have been abused don't get beyond that one emotion. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like I went to an adult survivors of child abuse uh, thing for about three years. Every single person there told me the same story that they told people three years later that were the first people who came. They told the same story to the same, to the same story, the same inflections, the same tears, the same everything, but they never dealt with it. They just told the same story over and over and over again because they never got to feel the truth. It's the truth you have to feel. The problem that most abusers feel is they feel the error. Do you know what I mean by that? So what did the abuser tell you? Through their actions, they told you certain things. They told you you're no good. So what do you believe? You're no good. What do you feel? You're no good. Is it true? No, it's not. It's not going to heal you. You have to feel the truth to heal, not the error to heal. Do you understand? You have to get beyond feeling the error and fe into feeling the truth eventually. The truth is that you are worthy. No, that's the truth. But they, they cause you to feel this. So this is what you feel all the time. You're feeling the error that you're not worthy. At some point, you're going to have to feel the truth that you are worthy. To do that, you're going to have to release the error properly. But you're living in the error. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. It's like you're going around, and this happens to most people who have been harmed. They go around believing it for the rest of their lives without confronting the belief system. So, for example, for yourself, you're going around believing that people just want to harm you all the time. People want to attack you. That's all you're going to ever attract. That's not true. It's one of the holes that are here that can be patched up. Right? That's true. And it can be patched up by feeling it properly. That's true. And eventually you'll get to feel the truth, which is that you won't be attacked all the time. That you'll be free of people attacking you all the time. That's the real truth that eventually you'll get to feel. So you have to feel the truth of what happened to you and the, feel, the truth from God's perspective and eventually to heal the problem. And most of us don't do that. Most of us feel the error only. And so we never heal. Mary, you'd like to say? Oh, it's actually a sincere question, babe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think it is. Maybe it's going to be a statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go on. It's about what you're saying. Because yep. I feel I sense a few people grappling with what you just stated about feeling truth versus Definitely. feeling error. Yep. And my experience is having memories of abuse myself and also 
memories of yucky things being done to me um, in my childhood and various things, is that often when I'm feeling the error, uh, I can get into a self-punishing place, which is not actually... I, I tell myself that's feeling the error, but it's actually not. It's re-abusing myself. Correct. So here's the symptoms of feeling the error. One is self-attack. So I get into this cycle where I just go, oh, I'm an idiot, this is useless, I am crap, you know. Yeah. And it just gets very... It ends up... There's not even any tears anymore. It's just internalised rage Correct. towards myself. Correct. So an attack of yourself, eternalised rage towards yourself, yeah. And then I do other really self-attacking physical actions, like I overeat. Overeat. And before I found divine truth, I used to drink a lot of alcohol, Yeah. occasionally take drugs, you know, whatever would get me away from just living in that feeling of the error. So that's self-abuse. Yeah. Yes? Um... There's other ones you've had? It becomes very circular. I can't... It does. Yeah. But I'm thinking more of the hopeless feeling that oh, you yes, often tell yourself. Definite you feel hopeless. Despair and hopelessness. Where you feel there's no point in dealing with it anyway. It's, it's never, never going to change. never going to change. Or leave me. Yeah. It's never going to leave me. It's no point. I might as well just shove it back down using whatever technique I can. Right? Keep it under control. Because the situation's hopeless. Right. This is all error-based thinking, by the way. Can you see why? From God's perspective, is it hopeless? No. You can always release something. From God's perspective, is it right to abuse yourself? No. You should never abuse yourself or anybody else. From God's perspective, is it right to attack yourself? No. You should never attack yourself or anybody else. You know, you need to, it applies just as much to other people, to yourself, as it does to other people. So what other techniques do we have which demonstrate that we are feeling the error rather than the truth? So, Denial. But a lot of times when we're in denial, we're not feeling anything. So I'd probably like to focus on when we're actually feeling something, but it's not helping us. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes, but that could be a, a rejection was the word uh, that was used. And perhaps we can use the microphone so that way we can get the sound. Um, but again, that could be an actual emotion that we need to feel, or it could be uh, an issue of self abuse Projection onto others. Well, yeah, let's, let's say anger, shall we? That's what I was going to say, yeah, anger. Right, to be more specific. Uh, and let's do another one, which is related to anger, but, but is a much more insidious. Judgment. And I, and I find I ju I'm judging others and myself. Correct. Constantly when Correct. I'm in this place, yeah. So anger is, is the projection from yourself outwards to others or to yourself. You might be angry with yourself or you might be angry with others. A judgment is when you are judging yourself or judging others. These are all indications that you are not feeling the truth. You are actually feeling the error. You know? And when you do that, this is very cyclical. It continues over and over and over again. And you can go on for years like this. And in fact, there's been people who've gone on for decades like this. And some people go on their whole life on earth like this and a lot of their life in the spirit world until they realise what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I've found I do that because I'm actually afraid to feel the truth. Yes, and this is an important fact to realise is the main reason why we choose to do all of those things is because our parents taught us to do all of those things rather than to place the responsibility on the people who created the problem. In other words, our parents, in avoidance of their own responsibility of what they felt in their life, taught you that you had to do this in order to get their approval, their acceptance and so forth. And so now you believe that once you see an error inside of yourself, you've got to do all of these things. And all of those things won't actually help you release the error right? all they do all that is is living in the error because all of these things are erroneous positions from God's perspective so 
and naturally they're not going to help you release anything. And all that you're doing by doing these things is really doing what your parents wanted you to do in order to accept their treatment of you. So all you're doing is reinfecting yourself with the same disease over and over again. Your parents wanted you to attack yourself because then, then they didn't have to bother doing it. Your parents wanted you to abuse yourself because then they didn't have to abuse you and you were under control. They wanted you to feel like it was hopeless without them. Without them, everything's hopeless. They want you to be angry, but not with them, with yourself. Many times they want you to be angry. Now, of course, that spills over generally in our, in our adult life to others. And they want you to judge, generally, but not them. Yeah. And they're happy with me attacking myself because then I won't feel attacked by them. Exactly. The majority of people will not attack you or abuse you if you are attacking yourself or abusing yourself. And you're not sensitive to what, what they've already done in terms of attack and abuse. Correct. There's an underlying acceptance inside of the, of the person emotionally that I deserved all of this anyway. I deserved it. Make sense? Yep, if we go side. You want to say more, maybe? Yeah, it's all right. Is it changing the subject, though? No? Yep. So, what do you want to say? So, um, and this is where the kind of question, possibly a statement, comes in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, feeling the truth, to me, how that feels to me now, is that I allow myself to feel the pain yes. of the erroneous beliefs I have about myself. Yes. But... More importantly, the pain, it happens really when I allow myself to feel the pain of what happened in relation to God's truth. So sometimes I did this shitty thing and yeah. I'm feeling, God's truth is that was a shitty thing Mary used her will to do yeah. and that hurts. Yeah. And sometimes it's actually someone really hurt me there. They used their will then and that hurt. Yeah. God's, God's opinion on that is that they did something there that was harmful to me yeah. and I'm feeling the pain of that harm. The key always is to feel the pain, yeah. whether whatever its source. Yeah. Now, this is not feeling the pain. This is, this is actually perpetrating more pain. That's the difference. So there's one thing that's feeling the pain. When you actually feel pain, the pain gets relieved. When you do these kind of things, the pain intensifies because you are perpetrating more pain, whether it's to yourself or to others. So, so from a, um, you could say from a, even from a spiritual and emotional perspective, when you choose to feel the pain of whatever the pain actually is, the truth, the, the painful truth, if you like, of course, in the end, you won't see it as that. You'll see it as a freedom, freeing truth. But it's painful when you first come to acknowledge it. It's like the surgeon with the scalpel cutting your flesh to get something out, right? There's a feeling of pain there. When you feel the pain itself, then you will not revert to these behaviours. If you're reverting these to these behaviours, it's a sign that you prefer to feel the error rather than feeling the pain. In fact, we almost do it because the pain of doing that is preferable to us than this pain. Mm -hmm. The irony is this pain perpetrates more pain. So it doesn't actually release anything. It actually creates more pain to ourselves and others. So it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt down the track doing this. Again, at some point, you want to say. This is the part now where the question happens. Yep. Um, so... <laughs> Yep. The, <laughs> the only emotion in that list in, aligned with the error that I ever feel any relief experiencing is hopelessness. Now, sometimes I know I choose hopelessness in rage, right? and that's a very dead feeling. It's very... It's mm. not only a dead feeling, you can feel when it's enraged because you can feel, what the bloody use is this doing this? You know, you can feel yeah. the rage in it. Yeah. But when you truly feel hopeless, you'll feel the pain of hopelessness, which is a real gr soft grieving emotion. Very, very different experience. Yeah. So that's, and that to me feels like when fear has overwhelmed me and I'm not feeling it and I just feel hopeless then. But grieving it 
sort of a, softens me. A lot of this me. kind of hopelessness where it's, it is angry hopelessness, mm -hmm. really, where you want to tell yourself it's hopeless and you feel angry that it's hopeless and you feel, what's the, what's the point? And you often feel quite, you know, expletive, 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 <laughs> what's the point? Yeah. Kind of thing, because it's, it, you're so angry about it. And that's an indication that you're in this error-based mm -hmm. feeling. When you feel the pain of hopelessness, it's more of a soft grieving uh, emotion. It's not, a, it's not a huge rage that you feel everything's hopeless and you're just going to give up anyway and you're not going to do anything. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Selena? If we go Selena then. So. so that soft hopelessness, would that be more like um, I'm a loser? Sorry? Would it be a feeling like I'm just a loser? No. Not good at That's this. That's that's another one of these. That's still anger? Okay. If, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The soft hopelessness, it just feels like a grief of hopelessness. It's just grief. Like, yeah. Sorry? Is the truth that you should fear them? Fear these? Fear these parents. Like, is there not some... Would fear not, like, the recognition that they are something you should be afraid of? Why should you be afraid of them? Well, because they can perpetrate these things on you. You're just a child. Uh, they can only perpetrate them on you when you're a child. What are you now? Well, an adult. So they can't perpetrate them on you unless you allow it when you're an adult. Do you get what I'm saying? If yeah. you believe... Yeah. If you are afraid of your own parents when you're an adult, you are living as a child still with your parents. Does everyone get that? But I think we may, be, we may do that. Most people do do that. That's, I guess that's what I'm feeling well, inside of me, is this real connection to fear. Like, my parents are both past, yeah. but I still fear all of those things about them. You fear all of these things. Well, no, them. I fear... You fear what they did or fear... That no, I fear that I still need to live in response to their opinion and their actions and their, what they were perpetrating on me. Yeah, which means you're still a child. You haven't grown up yet. Yeah. yeah. How old are you, sorry? Yeah. 65. 65. <laughs> okay. So you're a 65-year-old child. So how long is it going to take before you let go of this fear of your parents? Can you see it's an act? No, exactly. It has to exactly. happen, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. That's yep. what I was feeling. Why do we fear our parents? What's the main reason why we fear our parents? Uh, just use the mics. So. Loss of love. Like feeling like you've, there, you just, there's no love. No, nope. it's not the main reason why we fear our parents. Let's have a go over here. What was your name? Hi, I'm Lucette. Lucette. It, for me, it's because I need them to take care of me. No, that's not true either. You don't. Oh. <laughs> you don't need them to take care of you. There's one main reason why you fear your parents. Sorry? We're still seeking their approval? You are, but that's not the reason why you fear oh, them. Oh, okay. Nina? We don't want to confront the fact that they never loved us. That's true, but what about that don't we want to... That, why don't we want to confront it? Because we'll feel unlovable and uncared for. So what are we preventing? Our own feelings. The only reason why we fear our parents is because we want to prevent our own feelings. The only reason why you, pref you fear anything is because you want to prevent your own feelings about it. It's the only reason why you're afraid of anything, in fact. Does everyone get that? So, so it's not your parents' attitude towards you that you're afraid of. It's feeling your parents' attitude towards you that you're afraid of. Do you see the difference? Because you can feel your parents' attitude towards you and release that emotionally. And then I can guarantee to you, you will not be afraid of them no matter what they project at you. You just have to be prepared to feel the emotion about what they feel about you. And most of us aren't prepared to do that. Most of us don't want to do that. Most of us want them to feel differently. So you know what we're doing with our parents most of the time is this. Here we are, so here's me, little Johnny, I was called. 
here's my mum and dad. When I was little, they were bigger than me, right? They had power over me, they had all these things. But, but now I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I have nothing to fear from my parents except to feel my own emotions about what they feel about me. That's the thing I'm afraid of doing. Now, I am afraid of doing that because they, they might still be projecting stuff at me. In fact, highly likely they are. Right? It's very unusual for the parent to change before the child does. It's very unusual for a person who abused us in some way to change before we, the person who's the victim of abuse, change. Right? So the reality is that even as we're changing, they're probably still projecting at us things. And this applies to you if you have children, by the way. You're probably projecting things at your child that they feel is unpleasant and, and they are cha might have changed from there, but you're still projecting the same thing. It's the same principle. This projection coming out of you towards your child, or in my case, if I'm the child, I'm receiving the projection. If I've relieved myself of all of the fear associated with any feeling inside of myself about myself, then anything they project at me, I will no longer believe. And I will no longer feel. Automatically. I won't believe. So if they might be saying, little Johnny, you're a crock of shit. Right? And, I, and I, if I have dealt with this emotion that I feel my parents feel that way about me, and I've worked my way through it, and I know that I aren't, I know that I'm worth something, they can project whatever they want at me. It's not going to have any effect whatsoever. So it's not a fear of the parents that I really have. It's a fear of feeling my own emotional response to what they project at me that I have. And the same applies in every single relationship you have. It's not the fear that you have in that relationship of the other person. It's a fear of feeling your own feelings as a response. This is our main problem. Our main problem is that we are unwilling to feel our own feelings that are responding to whatever is coming at us. And that's the area that we need to do most of our work. And, and when we do that, you will no longer fear, fear anyone. So you can actually get to the point where you've still got emotions inside of yourself, you've still got problems inside of yourself, but you no longer fear anyone around you because you realise that the only thing to fear is your own emotional response. That's the only thing you're really afraid of. You're afraid of whether you can cope with your own emotional response. That's what you're afraid of. And once you know that you can cope with your own emotional response from anything you no longer are afraid of anything right? to the point where it restricts your life. So the thing for us to focus on is not what are they doing to me, but is rather what am I feeling about what they are doing to me. Because once you work through that and you're no longer afraid of dealing with that, then whatever they do, you'll be fine with. Right? And I mean whatever they do. Like they can murder you and you'll still be fine with it because you've now, you know that you can cope with any feeling. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, I want to go to the toilet, so we're going to have to have a break. I think some of you probably want to go too. So let's have a break for 10 minutes. What is the time, by the way? Oh, 4.37, okay. Um, let's have a break for... Do you want to keep going or... Take a break for a quarter of an hour? Everyone have a drink? Uh, before we uh, stop tonight, I'd just like to probably discuss with you one more thing. Um, and that is, that is what I notice happening for many of you um, that, that I find is quite... Uh, it's quite like an overbearing emotion that comes out of many of you at, at different times. Um, let, I've told you a bit about my life now, right? 
So, so did anybody help me find out the things I'm telling you? Okay, so I got no help from anyone on earth anyway. No help. All right. So how did I find out the things that I'm telling you? So I had to do some things, didn't I? What did I have to do? I had to develop a desire, which remember was the exercise of my will, wasn't it? What else did I have to do? I had to pray, which is also an exercise of my will. I had to experiment, but that's also an exercise of my will. I had to have some faith that by exercising my will in a certain direction, I would receive answers and responses. I had to have some faith that that would happen. I had to feel by myself without projecting at anybody else. Right? So that's humility, isn't it? I had to be humble and feel myself, feel all of my emotions, feel what I'm feeling right now every single time. No matter what anybody else was saying, I had to feel myself. I had to also what? Desire, Desire or want the truth. So it's an exercise for my will to receive truth. I wanted to know the truth and I wanted to love. I wanted to love God and you. Right? I wanted to do those things. Those are the five things that I focused my life on. Right. The other five basic things, aren't they? That I've been explaining to people recently, the putting it all together talk it talks about all that. Now what I see people doing constantly with me is they think they think that me telling them things is going to help them. So all of your questions today have been about me telling you things. And you know what? It's probably not going to help you. Do you know why? Because what is going to help you? You're going to have to feel some things for yourself. Are you not? That's what, that's what humility is, isn't it? is it not? Feeling some things for yourself. You're going to have to exercise your will to feel some things for yourself. You're going to have to have some faith that feeling some things for yourself is going to actually lead you to answers. I didn't know these things that I'm telling you before I felt. So no amount of me telling these things to you before you feel is going to actually give you the answers. The answers can only occur if you go through the process of feeling them for yourself. Now, the majority of you don't want to do that. Do you know why I know that? Because if you did right now want to do that, you probably wouldn't be sitting here. You know where you would be? you'd probably be in your room by yourself attempting to do one of these five things. Right? And everyone goes, but, but how do I find out about my emotions? You find out about your emotions by feeling them. You're, so what? <laughs> You're missing out anyway. So the comment that Nina made was, but I might miss out on something you might say. Yes, you're missing out anyway because everything I'm saying to you right now generally doesn't enter you. And it won't enter you until you feel. Do you see that? So, so the problem we've got is this. The more I feed your addiction to know... Before you feel, the worse I'm making your life. Can you see that? And basically, we have an addiction to know before we feel. That's our problem. That's our problem. We're not willing to go through this process like you're not willing to go through it like I've had to go through it. All right. And what I would like to discuss with you at some point this week 
is that willingness, developing that willingness, because to me that's something that we can have a conversation about that is going to be beneficial. You see, it's ve there's very little point in me having conversations with you about your emotions and why they exist. Because until you feel them, you won't believe a single word I'm saying anyway. You won't know. You won't know. You will only know after you've felt. That's the only way I knew, was after I felt. If someone came up to me 15 years ago and said, why is it, you know, I'd, I'd gone to this adult survivors of child abuse thing for three years and I come out thinking, this is really strange, like nobody's progressing. And I'm sitting there pondering why nobody I observe in, this, in these meeting groups is progressing from their abuse. They're all abuse survivors. They call themselves survivors. And I'm thinking, you're not survivors yet, you're victims still. Right? Because nobody's actually progressed the entire time that I've been here for three years. And some of them had been there 10 years, and, and I asked people, well, what were they like 10 years ago? Pretty much the same. They hadn't progressed for 10 years. And I'm asking myself, they honour the truth about what happened to them, and yet they're not progressing. Why is that? Now, it wasn't until I started to feel some things emotionally that I realised why that was and that I can now explain it from a psychoanalytical perspective. Right? Before then, I didn't really know why. I, I wondered why, but didn't know. And I come up with ideas why. Of course, anybody can do that, but I didn't know. Now I know. Why is it that I can feel your emotions? If we wait for the mic, Nina, get it way. Yeah, you should know better, actually, on that one, certainly. <laughs> Go on. Um, because you've been through them yourself. Not just that. There's some emotions you have, for example, that I've never had. So, but I can still feel your emotions. Right. So what allows me to do that? Having become really sensitive. Yes, so how did I do that? How did I become sensitive emotionally? Well, allowing all the feelings within yourself so there's no barrier to feeling. Okay, so this is me again being... I missed the question because I was thinking about my answer so I didn't even hear what you were saying then, sorry. Yeah. Mm. It's me being humble, isn't it? Yeah. Being sensitive, yep. like you said, yep. Yep. to all of my own emotions. So I had to be humble and that made me sensitive. And that made me so sensitive that once I was humble to most of my emotions, there was now no longer any blockages between me and you. So normally there would have been so many that I would have met you and I would have had no idea about what you felt now, what you were feeling before, what you felt about me, what you felt about others. Like, I was so detuned that somebody once asked me, what would I do if my, parent, my children were murdered in front of my own eyes? And I said, I don't know. That's how insensitive I was before. All right. So how did I become sensitive? By being humble to my emotional experience. All right. That's the only way. Not by somebody telling me what my emotions were. Right, right. so I guess what I'm... I, I've, I've got this thing, dialogue running inside of me that... Far away. <laughs> you... Um, having told me different things, has kind of, it has been helpful. Of course it's been helpful because it's created a level of awareness, but you could have developed your own level of awareness without me saying it. Sure, but I don't know that I would have worked all of this out as, as quickly, you know, like I feel that what you've offered me... So what are you avoiding? Um, Why do you do it? Do you, you said you won't work it out as quickly, so that tells me that you want it to go faster than what you believe you can go doing it by yourself, number one. Yeah. So you want to be reliant on me to make you go faster than what you believe you can go yourself. So it really comes back to developing that relationship with God because that's exactly. going to be the fastest way out of here Exactly. Anyway. You don't want to do that. You instead want to have a reliance on me. Yeah, right. Now, what do I want? You don't want to support the whole no, world. No, I don't, want, I don't want you relying you. on me. I don't want you relying on me at all. Sure. Right? I'm trying to teach you how to be reliant on God, not me. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> right? So that, that I definitely don't want that. So how, how, like, I've got a question forming here. It's like, 
there's an ability to help people yes. up to a certain point almost. Yes. And what's that point? So that, that's probably my question, actually. That's a great question. Yeah, let's answer it, shall we? Because that is a good question. What, can they, what do they have to do to help themselves? Feel. That's, they've got to get to that point. So how can you help them up to that point? Am I supposed to be hogging the microphone? Well, you, if you, like what you've done is you've given us an understanding of how the laws operate on our souls so that okay, we can use so, that as a backdrop. So we've offered some truth about how the soul works. Yep. So that helps you, doesn't it? Yep. So yep. truth about the soul itself. So let's look at some of the truths that help you come to the point where you're w desiring to feel. Understanding the truth about your own soul yep. helps, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, what else helps? Just straight behind him. And, and, yeah. <laughs> so let's go, Jim, first. Okay. Um, truth about a specific interaction, like earlier, twice today at least, you guys pointed some things out to me. So facing the truth about life. Yeah. Right. But, but, it, but it's like a confrontation helps. to how I was perceiving myself. Yeah, but you could have seen that without us. Yeah, I suppose some of it, but not always. Well, why not always? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't you? Yeah, good point. Of course you can. I can, yeah. yeah you can, but you don't want to. You want somebody to be to come along and tell you because what do you get to feel then? You get to feel, oh, somebody loves me. Oh. <laughs> he cares enough for me to say <laughs> something. Oh, that's a lovely feeling. <laughs> Isn't it? You get to feel those kind of feelings. I don't get to feel that. <laughs> so why should you get to feel that? <laughs> uh, the truth about God's laws. Okay, so God and God's laws. God and God's laws, very important truths, aren't they? Very important to understand those because this helps you develop desire or if you lo think about it, it helps you develop the exercise of your will power to do something. Okay? It all, knowing the truth about these things also develops some faith that feeling is a possible solution to these issues, doesn't it? So I can help you only by helping you a bit with your will and faith, but I can't develop your faith and I can't develop your will. I can only offer you truths about these things that help you develop your faith and help you develop your will. That's all I can do. I can't do anything more than that. I can't make you feel. I can't feel with you. I can't share your feelings. And even when I tell you about your feelings, it doesn't help you because you think that you then have felt something when you haven't. So, so none of that helps you to actually do the feeling process, which is really, if you think about the feeling process, the feeling process is the next one, isn't it? The humility that is required, right? I can tell you the truth about what humility is. I can tell you the truth about how it's demonstrated or displayed. I can show you the truth from my own life, how it's demonstrated and displayed. But I can't make you be humble. Only you can do that to you. And I can tell you the truth about God's universe that I have learned, but the reality is you will learn it just as quick as I will if you were all of these other things. <laughs> right? Right? And if you really desperately wanted to love as much as I do, you, you'd want to do it. That's reality. You'd want to do it for yourself. You wouldn't wait for, you, you wouldn't wait for, you know, what's the date today? 10th? 9th? For the 9th of November to get an opportunity to ask Jesus a question before you try to resolve it yourself. You wouldn't wait till then, would you? Gee, if you do that, you know what's going to happen? If you get Jesus' time, <laughs> Jesus' time is 24 hours. Now, if you take away his sleep time, you got 16 hours at the max. You take away his going to the toilet, having something to eat, all that time, there's another three or four hours lost there. Let's say there's four hours lost there. Now we've got 12 hours spare, divided by 7.2 billion people. <laughs> that's, that's about right, isn't it? Yes. 7.2 billion people. And how much time does that give each of you? 
Can you see? <laughs> You've already had all the we time. We already had it. That you deserve. <laughs> if I'm actually going to be fair. <laughs> Can you see that? Can you see that it's physically impossible for me to help that amount of people without that amount of people just learning the principles of being able to help themselves? Is it not? Okay. So, every time you ask me questions about your emotional condition, what are you doing? You're asking me a question about something you could resolve for yourself. You're deferring your development and delaying your development until you get the opportunity to ask me something. Right? Now, God is capable of splitting all of God's time amongst all of God's children. Like, that's why God is God and Jesus is just a person. Right? <laughs> that's why there's a big difference between us because I have a limited amount of physical time, particularly on earth. God does not. If you think about God with Ray, God is giving out energy to the universe. God is able to have a full engagement 24 by 7 with every single one of God's creations, in particular every single one of us, the highest of God's creations, at all moments, at all times, without the person, you, feeling like you have received enough. That's God's power. My power is I can do that maybe with 10 people, 50 people for a couple of hours and then I'm... I need some replenishment. I need some. I need some off time. All right. Now, if you think about that and truly ponder about that, you would be far less focused on Jesus helping you answer your questions, and far more focused on God answering, helping you answer your questions. And our main problem here today is that we're not focused on God answering our questions. That's our main problem. That's our biggest problem. You want somebody who knows to tell you. But them telling you does not actually help you. Because it's only by going through the emotional experience yourself that you get helped. So even me telling you doesn't really help you. All I can do is share with you the truth about the soul, the truth about God, the truth about God's laws and how they work, the truth about your will, the truth about faith, humility, love and truth, those, those things. But me sharing with you about your emotional condition actually feels to me like a pointless exercise. And the reason it feels to me like a pointless exercise is because I can't feel your emotions for you. I know that until you feel your emotions, you won't even know what your emotions are. And, it's, and you're the one who needs to know what they are, not me. And while I might know them because I'm sensitive, like I said, because I've gone through the whole process myself, that doesn't help you, aside from perhaps feeding one of your addictions that somebody knows, but it doesn't actually help you. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And can you see why it's such an important thing to discuss? Yeah. This dependency that you develop. And this is, this is why cults happen. Cults happen and religions happen because there's dependencies that get developed. Right? And what I'm trying to teach you is you don't need to be dependent upon anyone. God is there for you. God can have a 24 by 7 in relationship with you telling you everything you need to know. Everything. Everything, God wants to tell you everything you need to know, everything you want to know, and then an infinite amount of things besides that. That's what God wants to do. Hi, I'm Julian. Um, yeah, that's, that was basically my question. It was like, I've heard you say before that we won't actually know truth until we receive divine love and then the truth enters our soul. So that I guess that's one of my biggest problems is I feel like I won't actually know truth until I do receive divine love. And, and to receive divine love, you have to let yourself feel love. And to do that, you have to let yourself work on all the blockages you have to feeling love, whatever they are. And for us, a lot of, for a lot of us, it's our addictions that stop us from, fe uh, from feeling love. So it would be great for us to have a conversation about our addictions. But you know what I find when it comes to addictions? Very few people want to know what they are. 
Because right? we're embarrassed about them and we feel judgmental about them. And a lot of times we don't think they're addictions, actually. We, we like them. We want them to be in place in our life. So we like what they are. So we, we, but to have a conversation about our addictions, that would be much more beneficial than having a conversation about your emotions. Because when we have a conversation about your emotions, unless you're actually feeling at the time we're conversing, it's really, it's really impossible to achieve anything. And, and you will not know truth without doing it, without feeling your emotions. So the truth can't enter you, love can't even enter you without you feeling your emotions. So it's imper the, the imperative really is to feel your emotions. All I can do is help you understand how it all works. Right? And that does help you alleviate some of your fears. And it does help you develop some faith and will. And it does help you, uh, if you wanted it to, to develop a desire for humility and a desire for truth. But I can't make you humble. I can't wave a magic wand and go, everybody here, agri-cadabra or whatever it is, everyone here is humble. And all of you go, oh, I'm humble all of a sudden. Like, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> is not something God is ever going to give as a gift. <laughs> Trust me. And so I can't do that. I can't, I can't help you be humble. You must develop it as a quality if you're ever going to connect with God. It's the same with all of these qualities here. They are, the responsibility is on you to develop them. Not, not, not me or anyone else. Yep. Hello, I'm Kevin. Um, in order to feel the truth, I, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about how it um, relates to the heart. To me, uh, it seems that the, one of the great things about feeling the truth is that it opens up the heart. And then as you, as you open up your heart, then you're able to more uh, successfully deal with, uh, with those emotional attachments. I agree with that. I don't know if I need to talk about it. <laughs> I, I agree that if you open up your heart, which is a sp state of humility, opening up to everything that's inside of you is opening up your heart, Truth automatically, like that's the doorway to truth. That's all you have to do in the end. The majority of us don't realize that our major problem is not wanting truth. You know, many of you said, when I asked you at the start of today, you said the reason why you're here is you're seeking truth. You know, seeking truth isn't your problem. Do you know that? Because you are seeking truth, that's not your problem. What's your problem? Humility is your problem. <laughs> right? And faith is your problem and the exercise of your will is your problem. Those kinds of things are your problem. But particularly humility is the problem. Truth will come to you because you, many of you do have a strong desire to hear truth. You've already demonstrated that in your day-to-day -day life. You've been seekers a lot of your life, right? right? So you, you, you don't have so much of a problem with seeking truth, particularly external truth. The problem you have is feeling your own feelings, right? F actually being truthful and feeling your own feelings. That's the main problem you have. And you have a lack of faith about that it will work and you don't exercise your will very often to make it happen. That's reality. That's where the problem is. And all of those things are tied up with problems associated with addictions. Fear. Or the reverse of fear, if you like, control, <laughs> anger. All of these things are the things that are affecting us mostly with those major areas. Right? And I can't, I can't even make you feel your addictions. All I can is, do is expose them. You've got nine days with me. You could choose to expose all of your addictions. Carol, do you want to say that? Just, just, uh, just might be on. I said, why don't we get started then? Let's and having have a, a conversation, conversation about, about addictions? addictions. Because very few of you want to do that. Well, well I, I want to do that. Let's go. Let's no, do you it. want to do that. So I'm happy to have a conversation with you about your addictions. Okay, I yep. love that. Yep. But it seems pointless doing it in a group if only one person wants to have a conversation. 
you say that, but do you really? If you did, you would already be doing it with me today. That's reality. If you really want something, don't you make it happen every time? You really wanted to be here? You're here. Some of you had to move a lot of things to be here, but you got here. You, when you really want something, you do do it. Do you really want addictions for, uh, exposed? No, you're not being honest with yourself. Honestly, you're not. The majority of you don't want your addictions exposed. So here's what I would like to do with you. I would like you to think tomorrow, do some work on your own addictions. <laughs> Instead of relying on me to tell you what they are, you do some sincere work on your own addictions. Now, what did you do yesterday? Well, the majority of you didn't work on your addictions. You know what the majority of you did? You fed your addictions. That's what the majority did. You didn't work on them, you fed them. You didn't want to look at them, you, you didn't want to expose them. You inter your personal interactions. You remember Mary coming in in the morning, Friday morning? What did she say to the group? Your addiction. Yeah? Now, when Mary said that yesterday morning to you, what did you go and do afterwards? For the majority of you, what did you go and do? Caroline? Um, I went and felt my addiction to facilitating things, and, and I recognized that it was coming up for me actually before I even came here with my kids. Agreed. And I really spent, I mean, I, I probably so haven't So isn't it an addiction it, to facilitate? Sorry, what? Is it, is it an addiction to facilitate? Is it an addiction to provide certain things and to work? I think it is. It can be. No, no. You see, that's not the real addiction. Oh, okay. So What's the addiction the is addiction? to get approval through, through facilitating or through um, to get like, I don't know, uh, just to get love maybe through providing. See, see how you're guessing now. Well, I felt this, I, I, I guess I couldn't put like verbal words to it, but I felt the I can addiction put verbal of words it. to every emotion pretty much, but why can't you? Because you haven't I'm felt them yet. <laughs> you haven't felt them yet. The real problem you need to start with is control. Definitely. But did you feel about that yesterday? How much you wanted to control? How much no. you felt like controlling? No. No, thank you. I will go feel that. No. What about other, others of you? How many of you even bothered to do any feeling about what Mary said? So one, two, three, a few of you bothered. Now would you say, how many of you spent four hours dealing with what Mary said yesterday? One. Okay, so one bothered. That tells me how much you don't want to face your addictions. Now that's the self-assessment of one person, by the way. And Donna, you focused on something entirely different than what you needed to. And you were in a unique position because it was when Mary interrupted the proceedings that you were actually involved, wasn't it? Now, if you weren't in that position but you were sitting in the chair, would you have done the same thing? Or would you? Probably not, hey? If it, if it wasn't you standing up here right at the time and Mary coming in and interrupting proceedings almost at that time and saying everything's in addition here, right? It's high. I agree, but now you want credit from me. Another demand. <laughs> Give who some credit. behind everybody. Yeah, I, you don't believe that, but no, that, that's I, a, no, kind of you don't. I do. No, you don't. No, I can feel your emotions better than you can. <laughs> and you don't feel that. You think you feel that. Okay. Now you're passive aggressive. Okay. <laughs> No, you feel angry when you're passive-aggressive, so feel angry. Feel angry. You're not receiving from this conversation what you needed. 
That's why we get angry. Anytime we get angry, it's because we're not receiving what we need. Now, let me point out, let's go back to the discussion. The discussion was, do you want to deal with your addictions? Yesterday, Mary came into a group of people, said there's a lot of addictions happening here, and yet only one of you went out and felt about it, and that person went out and felt about it because they were the person who was probably interrupted at the time. That tells me how little you want to face your addictions. You see, to me, if somebody come in and interrupted a group, I would say, and say, everyone's in addictions here, I'd be in my room and thinking, wow, what did she mean by that? How was, it, how was I in addiction? What did I feel? What did I feel from the others? I'd be working the whole thing out if I really wanted to face my addictions. If I had a desire in me to face my addictions, when somebody uses the word addiction, I'd be going, bing, 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 bing. Alarm bells, warning bells, this is, like some, this is something I want to look at. Not something I want to go away and ignore for the rest of the day. Do you see? So how can you then today say to me you want to deal with your addictions? When yesterday you had a perfect example of working through your addictions and you never took it. You, can you see, I ask you the question, do you want to work through addictions? You want to tell me, yes, you do. But Mary gave the opportunity to work through addictions and you didn't. So what's the truth? What is the truth? Is it truthful to say that you want to work through your addictions when somebody gives you the opportunity and you don't? See, I, I, I can't... This, this is something we're going to have to be careful of this week. You want to tell me stories that you want me to believe and I can't believe them because your actions tell me different. Do you follow? And this is what I would like to discuss with you. <laughs> Things like this. Why do you think you can tell me a story when your actions tell me different? Why do you think you can get away with doing a whole heap of things and then saying you want something completely the opposite? Why do you think somebody should get up here and give their time to you for free accepting this rubbish from you? Why do you think that? Because there's certain beliefs you want to maintain about yourself. You see? That are not true. See, um, one, I like... I, and I think I brought this up before in a seminar. Um, I like uh, one of the comments in the conversation with God's book with Neil Donald Walsh. Where Neil Donald Walsh thinks he's talking to God, right? He's not. He's talking to spirit, but he's, he thought he was talking to God. But he's saying, th saying, he says, I've been searching for you all my life. Where have you been? And what did God say in return? Well, firstly, I was there all the time. And secondly, what a lie you just told me. You haven't been searching for me all your life. You've been searching for me for a sum total of 17 hours and 25 minutes. <laughs> or whatever it was, I can't remember the actual figure. And isn't that the case? You say you're searching for your addictions. You want to know what they are. How much time do you spend doing that in the course of a day? If you're really honest with yourself, the majority of us sit down for five minutes. If we're lucky in the course of a day, if we average it out over what hot time we spend in the week, we might spend maybe, if we're, if we're sincere even a lot of times, we think we're sincere, we might spend two hours in a week looking for our addictions. Now how does, how does two hours divided by seven days a week? So how many hours per day is that? No, no, it's two hours divided by seven. What's that? Don't you learn fractions when you're at school. What is it? <laughs> you don't want to say what it is. How many minutes is it? Shall we put it in minutes? 120 minutes divided by 7. Does that help you? All right. Can you see that's less than 20 minutes a day? Isn't it? Okay. It's less than 20 minutes a day. And, and many of you don't do that. 20 minutes a day looking for your addiction. And yet your addictions are your main blockage with God. That's what I found in my own search. My addictions are my main blockage with God. I want to know what they are because they're my main reason why I'm not feeling anything. They're the main reason why I can't feel. They're the main reason why I get angry. They're the main reason why I'm unloving to other people. They're the main reason why I'm unloving to myself. They're the main reason why I can't feel God's love. 
and they're the main reason why I can't reflect love to others. So to me it makes sense that I spend more than 20 minutes a day looking at them. Myself and Mary, we spend like at least four hours every day looking at our addictions. Every single day. To do that you need to be private time, don't you? Now if you've got a busy life, that's going to be pretty hard to do that four hours a day. But every single day. Some days we spend the entire waking time on our addiction. Like the entire time we're awake, 16 hours, we're talking about, we're having lunch, we're talking about addiction, we're having dinner, talking about addictions. We're trying to work out what that is, what that is, what it feels like, what it feels like, feel it, go and feel it, all that stuff. Carolyn. Um, I just wanted to ask you yeah, what that looks like in your day. Like, let's say you don't have the, like, the couple relationship to talk through it yep. so let's say I want to do that for four hours what would I do so when I was I by myself write in my journal I could pray I could take a walk and talk to God or what, what other things like practical things drink a lot of water I'm just trying to really like hone in on what all I those things, do yeah, I've done all those things is there anything else that like you found you did like personally isn't that enough I'm just wondering <laughs> if there's anything else in my, that I can use in my None toolbox. of those things sound satisfying, so you want one more? No, I just, I'm, I've got you now. I just want to make sure that you know, there's anything else that you found successful. Well, there's plenty of things I've found successful, but if you think about all the seminars I've presented, I've already told all, all of you what they were. Okay. You're all, if you've listened to those seminars, you already know what they were. Like there was one seminar I think I gave sitting down in Greece where I actually listed ten things that we do every single day, practical things that we do every single day. Um, so the same things that, there wasn't anything special that you did specifically for addictions, like in a certain situation, you might say, ask yourself a certain question or just something that was more what specific. What do addictions cover? What do they cover? Yeah, fears, okay. right? So, so how many times have I said to groups of people, write down a list of all of your fears? Yes. How many times have I said that? Do you update your list of fears every day? No. Do you, why not? Because you have a new one every day you, that you notice sooner or later. Why, why don't you? Like, I've got books and books and books of my fears. <laughs> uh, Mary's gone through them. Mary's got books of her fears. I've got books of addictions, baby. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I don't even know what the f feeling is, is under the addiction. I just know this is way out of harmony with love. Yeah. 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 And, and why do we do that? Because... We are sincere about trying to find out what's really going on. Now, what I'm putting to you, and there's something for you to contemplate over this coming day, because we'll have another session. I think we've got another session Monday, isn't it? What I'd like to leave with you tomorrow is this. If Mary gave you the opportunity on Friday to actually look at your addictions and you can say barely any of you did do that. Can you say that you're sincere about finding out your addictions? When you were given the opportunity? Obviously not. So the first thing I would like to see you do is look at why you believe you shouldn't have to look at your addictions. Can you do that? Can you at least give some time over the next day to contemplate why it is that you believe you should be able to ignore all of your addictions? What, what you, do you really feel inside of you about your addictions? Because I, I can feel what you feel, many of you. Many of you feel like, don't tell me what my addictions are. I want to hold on to them. Don't tell me what they are. I don't want to let them go. I want people to meet them. That's the real feeling I feel for many of you. It's not... I want to expose them and I want to process my way through them. It's quite the opposite, in fact. The feeling that I get from many of you is, I want this addiction met from you and I want this addiction met from you. And my whole reason why I'm here in this seminar, or let's call it this uh, thing, I don't know what else to call it. Um, <laughs> the whole reason why I'm here with this thing with AJ and Mary is because I want AJ and Mary to feed some of my addictions. I want them to tell me what I, what I could find out myself but don't want to spend the time doing don't want to do it now to be frank with you I feel you're going to have to be far more sincere than that with yourself for your own sake not for mine it doesn't worry me what you do with your life does that make sense 
It doesn't worry me because I can't do anything <laughs> about your life. I can't change you. I can't, I can't motivate you to have some will and use your will and have some faith. I can't motivate you to be more humble. I can't motivate you to want to know. I can't motivate you even to love. You will do such things as you receive God's love. And the only way you'll receive God's love is if you're willing to address why you've got resistance to these basic things. And one of the major resistance to these things is the addictions that we're in and the fears that they cover. That's the main reason why we're resistive. And so, so what I feel is necessary, really, is to examine the addictions. Now, you've demonstrated yesterday that you had no desire to do that, even though you say today you do. <laughs> yesterday, you demonstrated you had an opportunity, you demonstrated you had no desire to do it. That's fine. That, that, look at that and see that's the truth. Let's honour that truth. Let's honour the truth that barely any of us really want to face our addictions. Let's honour that truth. Right? So then the question comes, Will, what can I do to grow a desire to face my addictions? That's the real question then, isn't it? So what I would like to leave with you is, what are you going to do to grow a desire to face your addictions? Because I'm not responsible for facing your addictions. I'm only responsible for facing my own. Right. And while I can feel all of your addictions, I don't have any I don't bear any responsibility for helping you cure them or get rid of them. You do. They're yours. They you own them. They're inside of you. So so what I would look at is the desire here, whether there is really a desire or not. And I would put to you that the fact that you didn't do it yesterday when you had the opportunity, rather than having it in a seminar, pro, you know, you were given an opportunity through someone just through Mary, and it was, it was my advice to her, to trigger you straight away. So Mary said, they're all in addition there. Can you feel it? Of course I can feel it. What are you going to do about it, babe? She says, okay, I'll have to say something. Right? Normally I would say something, but I know Mary's addiction is that she wants me to say it. So, so she's got to say it now. Like. <laughs> One of my uh, addictions I wanted to challenge this week was well, not to rely on Not to on rely anything. on me, right? That's one of the addictions she's focusing on. So I said, here's your opportunity. Go in and give them the opportunity. She comes in, gives you the opportunity, and the majority of you, it went nowhere. And then today, you lie to me and say, you want to deal with your addictions. And I can, I can only say to you, that is a lie. I'm sorry, it's a lie. All right? But I would love to address why you want to believe you want to do it when you demonstrate through your actions that you don't want to. I'd like to talk about that with you. I would like to talk about with you developing a desire where you do want to deal with your addictions. I'd like to talk about that with you. So how about we do that? So if you can work through... Be honest with yourself about all the reasons why you don't want to face your addictions. Can you do that? So you think about over the next... Give yourself time, and you're going to need time alone, but you could also you know, occasionally get together with others. What did you come up with? Oh, yeah, I've got that one as well. You, know, <laughs> you can do that kind of thing. Look at all the reasons why you don't want to feel your addictions, why you don't want to know even what they are, why they scare you so much to even know let alone work your way through. Look at them. Let yourself feel about them. Does that make sense? If you can do that work, so the work, if I summarise it, is the real question is, why don't I want to know or feel my addictions? And I don't want to have the answer because I'm afraid. What I want is to know is what are you afraid of? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't want any generic answers here. You know? Do you think in any conversation I've had with Mary, Mary's been able to give me a generic answer and I've said, no worries, babe, I'll accept that? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. We spend from 
8 o'clock last night to 11 o'clock last night discussing, so that was what, three, four, three hours. We didn't get to bed till midnight last night, myself and Mary, because we were dealing with some addictions. And that was after we talked with you guys. Well, when did we leave dinner? It was about, about eight or nine. Yeah. From then, right the way to we went to sleep, which was 11, 11 or midnight. Right. Then we spent, for, well, I spent from eight till midday. Crying pe- yeah, and feeling yeah. this morning. You might have heard Mary crying when you walked past our room. Right? So what, why do we do that? Because we want to know what they are. And we demonstrate by the amount of time even that we spend on it that we want to know. Remember I gave a talk some time ago about uh, where I, I can't remember the talk, I think it might have been one that we gave in the last year and a half, but um, where I talked about people's use of their time and what it indicates. What your tre- see, what is your treasure? And people got, you know, on the net, all I heard was about was how we talked about money. That was it. Like, the real message of the talk was, where do you spend all your time and where do you spend all your money? Because that's what you care about. Right? Mary and I spend almost everything we do either sharing or personally developing issues regarding our own development in love. That's where everything goes. All of our energy, time, resources, everything. Right. And, and that's why we get to have a relationship with God that's closer than most because we're willing to go through all of that. We want to. We desire it. Right. So that's what I would like to encourage you guys to do is to, why don't I want to know or feel my addictions? Does that make sense? But better put S on the end there, Ben, because we have plural. <laughs> so some of admit to that. Why don't I want to know or feel my addictions? And what I would love to do is have a discussion with you on Monday about all the reasons why you don't want to, rather than you telling me that you do want to. Because I have seen demonstrated yesterday and today that you don't want to. So I can't believe you when you tell me that you want to. All I can see is that you don't want to. So let's be honest about that. We don't want to. And start there. That's what I've had to do, be honest about everything. I've had to be honest, yeah, I don't want to do that. And then be honest about why I don't want to do that. And I've had to be honest about all sorts of things I don't want to do that I should be doing if I want to have a relationship with God. I definitely need to do them. And I've had to be honest with all the things about all the things that I do that I want to do that I shouldn't be doing as well, right? I've had to be honest about all that as well. And I haven't had someone on my back doing it for me. I haven't had someone, you know, giving me a pep talk or or telling me, you know, you need to do this. I've done it because I realise the necessity of it. Does that make sense? I don't tell Mary, you have to do this all the time. I tell her, you either want to do it or we're not here together anymore. <laughs> Simple as that. It has to be your want, your desire, not mine. I can't drive somebody else. I can't even drive the person who's my partner. I can't drive my children to do it. Everything has to come from your own heart at some point, right? So let yourself do that. So if we can do that with that question, and then the very next question I'm going to ask you, what do you think that's about? that's going to be the following Wednesday. Do you know what I mean? uh, It would be, why don't we want to feel... Oh, wait, no. You already said that. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> yep. Now I'll feel my addictions. What would be the next question we need to ask ourselves? Enrico? Interesting. Interesting how your addictions played out there. You know what happened there? You weren't willing to get up and get that microphone. Do you know why? Because one of your addictions was in play. And you know what that addiction is? A woman will do it for me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But fire away. What's the next one? Um, how to grow our desire to fill our addictions? Identify them? Yeah, that's an important question. Yep. But I'm going to try to discuss that with you on that day, actually. 
What's under your addictions? Ah, so what, is, what do you think my next question is going to be about? Yeah, why don't I want to know or feel my fears? Because that's what creates all your addictions, right? Not wanting to know or feel your fears creates all of your addictions. Right? So, so that's going to be my next question. But don't worry about that because we'll write that down the next time. I only do one thing at a time. That's all I do. I go, okay, I've got all these addictions. I've got to face them. Let's look at why. I don't bother about analysing too much. I just go, what do I feel? What do I feel? And I try to get to the feelings. If you can feel some of these addictions tomorrow, it's going to benefit you immensely. If you can even have interactions with others, you go, there it goes again, there it goes again. Like Enrique there with, with um, Julia. Julie. You know, if you could feel that, you could feel you're sitting down, sitting down. You don't even want to step up and just reach over. You want her to do it for you. You want to be served by the woman. There's an addiction. Why don't I want to know about that? Because getting served by the woman makes me feel like the woman loves me. She cares about me. I get to feel all these wonderful things when she does that for me. But if I've got to get up and go to her and get the microphone out of her hand... I'm going to get angry with her. She hasn't served me. She hasn't made me feel loved. She hasn't made me feel wanted. You know what I mean? Feel those things. That's all we need to do, just feel them. In every interaction that happens at dinner time, who you sit next to, often who you're sitting next to is driven totally by your addiction. Did you notice what happened last night? Yeah. Why is that? No, no, it was really simple. Because you wanted to. No, we didn't want to. Michael? No one wanted to sit with you and engage you in a real meaningful conversation? Yeah, you know what happened? Here's the allocation of the chairs and the desks. All right, from the serving desk to the back. And there was all these little people all next to each other, nicely, tightly packed. And since we were the last people to get our meal, because we didn't eat anything much, where could we fit? We could only fit there. And then you know what happened? It was very interesting what happened. Four people came up. And they wanted to have a sincere conversation. So we did. We had a great time, actually, yeah, talking to those four people. But why would that happen, do you think? Because the majority of you are so focused on eating that you don't notice anything else when you're eating. <laughs> you don't notice what you're missing out on. Yeah. You don't notice. What, what addiction would cause that? Well, there's a lot, actually. Like Many of you are afraid to talk to us. If you feel properly, you know that you are, right? Why are you afraid to talk to us? Because you're afraid of what we're going to say, right? <laughs> Most of the time, you're afraid of what we're going to say. So, so you don't want us. It's sort of like, we're here, but where do you want us to be? We're perfectly happy, Mary and I, spending the whole time alone. Right? We're, we're happy with that. We don't need to spend time with you. But there are addictions even in what's going on in terms of what is happening. Many of you are not willing to confront your fear. Even just a fear of talking to somebody you're not willing to confront. Or a fear of getting something feedback-wise. A fear of being told you're needy about something and that we don't want to talk to you because it's like that. Or whatever the thing is. Like many of you are afraid of getting these kind of things and so you don't engage. You avoid engagement. Mm. I know I feel a lot of times um, unworthy of coming up. And last night I was feeling like, um, like sometimes it's well, what I was feeling was it's not nice to interrupt if you're in the middle of speaking with somebody. So you say you feel unworthy. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Okay. You don't feel unworthy. Okay. 
you live in unworthiness. Right. And actually not coming up helps you avoid the emotion of unworthy. Right. Do you understand? You're not feel you say you, you and I see this happening all the time. People are using the term I felt afraid. No, you weren't feeling afraid. If you're feeling afraid, you'd be locked up in your bedroom feeling afraid. And to be honest with you, if you felt unworthy, you'd probably also be locked up in your bedroom crying your eyes out if you really felt it. The truth is you're not feeling it, you're living in it. Mm. And there's a big difference between feeling something and living in it. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you see? Like if I, if, I, if I wanted to come up and talk to you and I felt afraid, you know what I would do? I would go to my room and picture myself in the situation of going up and talking to you and feel the fear associated inside of me about it. I wouldn't go up to you and say, I'm so afraid to talk to you. What's that doing? I'm projecting my emotion onto you and I'm not feeling it. Right. Right? I'm not feeling it. Because if I'm feeling it, I'd be probably in my room overwhelmed by it. That's what would happen if I felt it. So a lot of times when we say we feel unworthy, no, we don't feel unworthy. You're avoiding feeling unworthy. That's what's happening. You're avoiding feeling unworthy. Great. Thank you. You know, be honest about what is happening, really. Every time you say, oh, but I feel free, fear. No, you don't feel fear. Most of you avoid feeling fear. So, you know, when you say, you're, you, it, the reason why you don't come up and speak to myself and Mary is because you're afraid. No, it's not because you're feeling afraid. It's because you avoid feeling afraid. That's why you don't come up. It's not because you're afraid. If you were afraid and feeling it, you'd probably be home <laughs> feeling your fear for a few days and then you'd come up to us in a completely free state, being able to chat with us if we, as if we're just normal people, which, by the way, we are. <laughs> if, as long, if you need reminding of that, we are normal people. So, so you would you'd be not afraid of us any more than you'd be afraid of speaking to anybody else. So you'll get to the point when you deal with this fear that you'll be able to walk up to anybody Famous, not famous, doesn't matter. You'll be able to speak to them because you're not afraid. And, you're not, and you've let go of all your fear. Right? But at the moment, many of you are living in your fear. Fear of getting dinner? We're still all right. So, so many of you are living in your fear. And then you call it feeling your fear. See, that's a lie too. You're not feeling fear. You're living in your fear. Uh, you're not feeling unworthy. You're living in your unworthiness. Right? You're not feeling your shame. You're living in your shame. Right? That's a long way away because there's addictions and then there's all the other things we've got to feel, right? Before we get to actually feeling the causal emotion. And then if you're avoiding the addiction, the addiction is to avoid the shame or avoid the unworthy. That, that's why you don't come up because... You're avoiding the shame or avoiding the unworthy feeling. And when you're avoiding the unworthy feeling, what's that called? That's, no, that's called an addiction. <laughs> it's avoiding a fear and avoiding a fear is an addiction. The whole reason why we have our addictions is to avoid our fears. Right? And then you say, I want to confront them. No, you don't. You want to avoid them. <laughs> you see? That's why we have the addictions. You want to avoid your fears, not confront them. You want to avoid them. Be honest with yourself. I want to avoid them. Why didn't I go out and speak with AJ and Mary? Because I want to avoid feeling some fear. And if I was really feeling some fear, I probably wouldn't even go up and speak with them. I'd just imagine myself going up to speak with them in my own room and then I'd probably connect with what it's about. Because the reality is it's about some false beliefs about myself and Mary. It's about some false beliefs about truth. It's about some false beliefs about what love would do and what love doesn't do. Right? Many of you don't realise, but you have false beliefs about truth. You believe truth isn't <coughs> loving. And that's why you avoid myself and Mary. Uh, the real feeling many of you feel about us is that we're not very loving. Because we say the truth all the time. And the feeling that you have is that it's harsh. So be honest about that. You avoid feeling like it's harsh 
by feeding addiction. And the way you do that is by avoiding any interaction. You avoid the interaction, you don't get to feel, wow, that was pretty harsh, which was the addiction that you need to feel because truth isn't harsh. It's a false belief you need to go through, though, at some point, the belief that it's hard. Can you see? We, we can do different. We can do different. I feel this week is your opportunity to do different. To break down some of these natural barriers that you have towards growth, towards God. Just do different. Right? Babe? I just wanted to add that I've, I've found that addictions are the number one thing that people want to remain in denial about. And so it's so, and, the, and yet, in my experience, as I said to the group the other morning, I've never been able to deal with any emotion at all. Nothing has left me. I've felt none of God's love until I've been willing to face an addiction. Um, and yet it's often the things that... Addictions are the things that we judge inside of ourselves or we, we, we're ashamed to admit, and yet it's the most powerful thing to actually confront. Yeah, I don't it's the feel, beginning. But I don't feel that it's just judgment and a shame to admit. Many of you think they're good mm -hmm. to be honest many of you think they're good you believe that's what you should get these addictions met many of you have been taught from childhood that you should get these addictions met you know we were raising with the group in san diego about how you guys address issues at the restaurants and your expectations at restaurants you wouldn't get away with most of the things you do in restaurant in australia wouldn't get away with it. You know, I took one guy uh, to a restaurant who came from the States, took away and go to a restaurant, and he projected so much at the staff that the staff refused to serve. Nobody in the States would do that. There's not a restaurant in the States, I don't believe, that would refuse to serve you, that I've been to at least. You'd have to do some pretty bad things before you got refused. She just refused to serve him because he was obnoxious. And he was. He was obnoxious, actually. Uh, she, he, she refused to serve him. You know, we were talking today about, you know, in Australia, if you got served something that was a wrong order, they wouldn't give you your meal for free. But we went to this restaurant in San Diego. We only ordered this five-buck pizza, right? And, and they got it all wrong. They put cheese on it. And we didn't order cheese. So we just said, oh, we didn't order cheese. And they go, no worries. And they come back and they said, oh, this is, what was the word they used? We, we've taken care of it for Gratis, you. Gratis, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just no, she, she said, we've taken care of it. I said, what does that mean, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt what she meant. That she meant we've got the pizza. Of course you've taken <laughs> care of it. I didn't understand. <laughs> we've got the new pizza, you know, without the cheese. That was wonderful. Thank you. I didn't know what she meant until I looked at the bill, they'd taken the pizza off the bill. That would never happen in Australia, as far as I'm aware. I've, it's never happened to me in Australia. Why did they do that? Because all of you expect it. You expect it. You think that's good service. I don't expect it. It's amazing service, but I don't expect it. So I sort of see it as a gift, whereas you don't see it as a gift. You see it as a, as what should happen. They make a mistake of my order, they should give it to me for free. Yeah. Honey, would you share what you tipped them? Because <laughs> it was more than the cost of the pizza. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, this isn't right. <laughs> and I think we had a $15 meal, and I gave them 30 bucks. And they look at you real strange when they do that here, I noticed. Because, because the normal person here, when they get a wrong order, mustn't tip very much or even get away with tipping at all. Yeah. And it amazes me like how much expectation is driving their service even. They've become so afraid to confront these expectations. Yeah, so I suppose it's similar to Halloween, isn't it? Like, the kids come around, knock on the door. What do you want? <laughs> I want some lollies. Well, you're not getting any. You've got expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I bet none of you did that <laughs> on Halloween night. 
Because you, you are teaching your entire society to have these expectations. And you're teaching them that feeding addictions is love. And it's not. See, if someone expects of, to give me to give a gift of whatever of mine to them, I don't feel I can give it. Does that make sense? Because to give it would be feeding their addiction. And that would be harming them, in fact. Right? So that rules out Halloween, rules out Christmas probably. <laughs> and a lot of those other celebrations because most people have huge expectations about receiving. See, I feel whenever you have an expectation about receiving, whatever is given to you is not treated as a gift. You don't see it as a gift, you see it as a demand. You don't see it as a beautiful gift that was given unbidden. You expect it. And these are parts of the addictions that are happening, you see. So, yeah, let yourself analyse that. We're going, to, you, we're going to expose far more addictions than what you realise were present, right? That's expected, right? Yeah, because naturally it's the things we don't know that are the things that harm us most. Yeah. So if you can do that, that would be fantastic. So you would like to ask in closing? Two minutes to dinner. I'd just like to acknowledge... The incredible love that you've just showed us. It's, it's, um, I mean, most of us have been watching videos for long enough. So, are you saying don't. that me calling you a bunch of liars is love? Is that what yeah. you're saying? <laughs> We've all been watching videos long enough that we don't need to do that anymore. And one of my desires for this gathering was that we would go somewhere brand new. Yeah, and and yeah. what I'm seeing from what you're offering here today is so beautiful and new, well, and it gives many, us an opportunity. Yeah, this happens to our in our life all the time. It just doesn't get recorded. So a lot of people come to our home, for example. Robin's had that experience. There's a few others maybe that might have had that experience, where we have conversations that just don't get recorded. But this is what they like. This let's get real about what's really going on. Every conversation myself and Mary have is always like this. It's always what, what's real here, what's really going on. Not what fluffy thing do we want to think we feel, but what's really happening. So that's what I would like to do with you this week. Thank you for, yeah. for honouring us with that intimacy. It's my, it's my pleasure. Thank I you. have more fun doing that than I do having the other discussions about emotion. <laughs> So that what I would like to do is encourage you guys to do some of this homework that I give you. It'll, and again, you don't have to. It's your life, it's your desires, your passions, your whatever. Don't do it just because you think you're going to get told off for not doing it, because I'm not going to tell you off for do doing it. Yeah. I'm not even going to say anything about it. I won't, I won't even say who did their homework. Because I don't want to feel it, feed your addiction of feeling approved. But, it, but to be honest with you, you will do some things on your own back because you want to when you truly have desire. You won't need anybody else driving you or forcing you or pushing you or encouraging you or any of those things. You will do it because you want to. And that is the most powerful use of your will, doing something because you want to, not for any other reason, not for any other goal, not to please anybody doing it because you want to. So what I would like you to do is engage that for yourself. And if you don't want to, even contemplate working out why. Because that would be a powerful result from this week alone, if you could work out why you don't want to. Does that make sense? So let yourself engage that process. Okay, well, let's have some grubs, shall we? Yep.